Okay. So yes, uh, let's start with uh, practical things for course. So first we already discussed, you should go there to, the, to this link and you get all information that I will tell you now. now. Uh, and also there is a link on Telegram group. So if uh, there is a mistake in homework exercise or whatever, so you can write it there and you can help each other. So I like it if you help each other. So, uh, when I do research, I switch off Telegram. So I don't watch for like 10 hours or something. But if I do like silly uh, other work, I, I, I watch it. Um, so, uh, yes, practical things. So, uh, are there students from software engineering present? Yes, I'm from software engineering. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, for you, it's three modules. For the others, it's uh, uh, two modules. So, final exam in January. And so, let me start with the grading formula. So there will be homework, colloquium, and problems exam, I guess, like most of your courses. It's theoretical course for um, uh, in the first two modules. And so uh, the final score, so it, it is 35% uh, on uh, grade of homework plus 35 on grade of um, uh, colloquium. And 35% on the problems exam. So on problems exam. So let, let us go over the three uh, grades. So grades of, for homework, there is every two weeks, there is deadline for homework. Every seminar has two homework tasks and a bunch of other tasks. And so, uh, um, so every two weeks, you send four homework exercises to Yaroslav Ivan Ivanovchev. And so the, uh, the Google Class link is in, in this on the wiki. Uh, then the next thing is, uh, so the, by the way, the, after this lecture, so till 7.30 there is lecture, and then I, I don't know, 10 minutes later starts seminar, yes. And, um, so uh, then in seminar, you get the list of exercises so that they start just to check whether you understand things and then you uh, train problem solving. Uh, and homework will be like, uh, like a bit easier, like easier part of, of, of seminar questions. So every week you get two of them. And then, uh, and there are also extra homework questions. So if you answer such a question, I add the score to score of problem exam. So the last one, sorry, it's not adding up. Uh, small mistake, 0 0.3 for exam. But the extra problems I add up with this score. And um, uh, problems and problems, so, so you can solve it and you can use a uh, uh, Sipser book. Sipser book will be a ref, uh, S plus S E is, I don't know what it means. Okay, uh, you, you will use SIPs, uh, we will use SIPs or book for materials in uh, September and October. Uh, and you can use it on the exam and then a few other books. So the books that are on the Wikipedia for additional reading, you can use on the exam, but no other books and uh, also in paper. There are 12 books in the library, so I will get them from Sipser and a few other books. Uh, so this uh, Sipser introduction of computation. So it's very old book, more than 30 years old and students like it. So it's basic things, and uh, very good explanations. There is a more recent book for students in, in specialization of theoretical computer science, they do research. And uh, so they, they can use Aurora and Bala. Maybe you've already used it. Uh, and I, I forgot the title. I think it's Introduction to Computational Complexity. 
Well, myself, I've been reading it for, for like many, many, many hours at school book uh, with nice exercises. Introduction to computational context. And then there is very nice book for both levels. Um, it, it is Nature of Computation by Sipser. Well, it has an interesting background, but it's very thick book. So that's if you, uh, if you enjoy and have time, I recommend this book, uh, Nature of Computation. So, but uh, this is in, in the wiki. Okay, what else? Uh, so these books you can bring to the exam if you have hard copy. Like maybe it's good if some people buy six or uh, you, usually there is enough, but I have no clue how many students we have at the moment. So if it's indeed uh, 45 students as administration thought, then it means that half is missing now. Uh, and almost one third is missing. And uh, by, by the way, uh, for theoretical computer science specialization, how many students are there? Ten. 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 Ah, just 10. Okay. Yeah. So then we should have 40 students plus master students. Are, are there master students here? Uh, so at least two, it was told to me, but it was complete mess. No master students. Okay. That's actually. Uh, go a bit faster then. Uh, uh, so colloquium. So every lecture we will have like three or four theorems. And in colloquium, I, I uh, collect two or three theorems from each lecture. There is a list of 30 something questions in the end. So in, in the wiki, you find the list of previous year. It will be similar. But previous year, there was a huge mess in September. And we like miss two lectures basically. Um, so this year will be like 20% more material. So I added something about parameterized complex. So I want to like correct the level a little bit. So, uh, okay. But the, the, nothing dramatic. We will start gentle as usual. Uh, so for people on software engineering, so the, the last uh, lecture is optional for everyone, but not for software engineering on parameterized complexity. So you um, will get, uh oh, sorry. The great formula for software engineering is different because they have more materials in third module. And so for them, it will be one quarter for the coefficients are one quarter, one quarter plus, and then one quarter of the project. Okay, I call it uh, the grade of project, but it, it, it's it's a little bit more. So I will have materials on uh, smart LMS on parameterized complexity, and so uh, after this mandatory lecture, you will need to go uh, to it to this LMS course. I, I still need to make it, uh, and there you have some uh, movies and some quizzes and a uh, programming assignment with a grader. So you can basically do it whenever you want. The deadline will be the end of the third module. So that's the plan. So maybe by the end of September, uh, of January, I will be ready making it. And then somewhere in February and March, you go through the materials. So that maybe two or three days work or something. It, it's quite advanced uh, for theoretical computer science people but the projects are really nice. So the, the theory may be a bit complex, but uh, when you understand it, you get the reward, you can program the cool things on vertex cover and this joint path problem. So uh, I, I already look forward to setting up grader. So I, I already did part from last year. Now I will do a bit more. Uh, okay. Yes, that's for practical things. Okay, let's now say what is in this course. Uh, so theory of computation. So the real name should be computational complexity. I, I don't know why it's called theory of computation. So there was some other teacher who started teaching this uh, seven years ago or something. Uh, and uh, so why do you uh, need it? So first in theoretical computer science, well, that, that's like, uh, uh, 
half of theoretical computer scientists classify problems according to their difficulty. And that's the core of this course, core of computational complexity. And so how do we classify it? Um, so we, we look at resources of computation, like time, space, how much randomness, uh, if it's parallel computation, how much co uh, communication, when we build it with, when we build, um, a solution using circuits, how wide or deep are the circuits, was the trade-off? So there are many ways to uh, tell how difficult is a problem and what you can expect from programs or whatever machinery that solves this problem. Uh, okay, and then people on software engineering, they think, okay, that's very theoretical uh, uh, business. Why should we learn, learn this? And uh, well, the thing is that, uh, for, for most basic level programming, you do not need this at all. The thing is that in, in every company, uh, like even not too big companies, so that there is a guy who's famous uh, for solving all the problems when the rest of the company has no clue, some kind of researcher. And so uh, people go to this and they don't understand why this guy knows all the solutions, how to do things. And so if you're kind of such researcher, then you will find this course uh, useful, but it takes some years before you are in this position. So hopefully by the time you are there, you haven't forgotten this course. Um, okay. And so why? Well, well, so if there is no obvious solution, it means you, you will build a chain of reductions and, uh, fr from your problem to something that you know. And so you want to know whether you go in the right direction. And so each time you get a new problem. So if nobody knows a problem, usually it means problem is NP-hard. And so we will uh, learn how to recognize NP-hard problems. And then uh, you transform one problem to another, to another, to another. And then suddenly you're in the class B. But this transformation only works under certain assumptions. So that's the tricky part. And then you go further because you may be still too slow because you use uh, uh, linear programming. I mean, officially it's in P, but in practice uh, that doesn't work very well. Uh, so you need to be lucky for, for it to work. And then um, if you back an NP complete problem, that may be not a good idea. So it's kind of sign where to go. So in, in research, and theoretical computer science. If you want PhD and algorithms, then you will use it all, all the time. Because um, how, so I don't know if some of you have done mathematical research. So what do you do if you want to solve problem? So uh, you want to prove theorem. And so in the beginning, you believe the theorem and you're searching for proof. And then you don't, I mean, if it's a difficult problem, you don't find the proof. So what happens by nature, something very good happens. You start to believe the opposite of theorem is true. And then you try to prove and you fail. And so you flip flop. Okay, but what if you have a problem and you want to find an algorithm that runs in polynomial time? By the way, I didn't say, why do we need polynomial time? What does it mean? So it means that uh, we get a set of inputs and we want an algorithm that for every input, uh, is guaranteed to give an answer in time polynomial in the length of the input. And polynomial time is not practical measure, but it's condition. If you cannot even invent or think of a problem that runs in polynomial time, you will definitely not have a practical algorithm. So, um, uh, so it depends a bit on input size, but normally if, if it's to the power four, it's not practical and to the uh, like a graph where your uh, uh, runtime depends on number of edges to the power four, it, it's usually not practical unless you promise the graph to be very small. Okay, but I'm distracted. Um, so uh, we want to make our boss happy. Like the boss is supervising big company and to get one product, he needs like a chain of 500 tasks that needs to be done. And if some of these tasks are done not optimally, uh, it means that competition uh, can outsmart his company. And so what's the disaster is that several of these tasks, the, the, the result and the price of product, it um, uh, add multiplicatively. So if he has uh, 20 steps, 
that multiplicatively are a few percent less optimal than competition, it adds up to 20% or 30% more expensive. It means he will lose against competition. He will go bankrupt. So his job is from these 500, make sure that almost all of them are done optimally. And so if you can give, if you have an algorithm to whatever, uh, you need to match uh, products to, uh, you need to match um, complaints to people who address them. So you solve matching problem. If, if this matching, uh, maximum weight matching is done in polynomial time, then your boss is relieved because he knows from the 500 steps, this step is very fast and competition will not beat him. So he can focus on other steps. Okay. Uh, so yes, I'm trying to answer like uh, why people in software engineering should uh, care about this, but it's more like in research oriented jobs. And the painful problem is that by the time you're doing such jobs, people have already around you have already forgotten this theory and it becomes difficult to prove to, to, when your boss asks why do you why don't you use such solve uh, why don't you use uh, whatever algorithm and then you say no it will never work because it's npi by the way um there are uh, nasty companies who uh, uh, on on solicitation uh, interview questions so they, they give you NP hard problem and they ask you what is the best algorithm you can come up with. And so if you recognize problem as NP hard and then you try something and you say, oh, this runs in quadratic time. So it, it, it is, uh, it's helpful to back off then and double check again and find the solution because they set up trap for you if you, so you can weaponize yourself. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, I, I don't have information on how often uh, NP com NP hard problems are used to check uh, algorithm skills. Okay. Uh, yes, that was a lot about philosophy. I should check the time. Uh, so I'm speaking for 15 minutes. Uh, are there practical or philosophical questions? Um, what is uh, the statistics of uh, successfully finishing uh, students um, of this course? Ah, um, uh, let me think. I, I, I mean, most students successfully finish. So successfully means four out of 10. So this is very easy. So unless you're ill and you really not prepare for something. Okay, I, I will tell you. Um, so if you want to... So there are students, if you want to pass with minimal grades, so what's your strategy? So then first, uh, look for easy homework, make sure you have half of the mark for homework. And then the colloquium consists out of three lists. One list is basic knowledge. So you need to know anyway. If you don't know this, I, I don't let you pass, but it's only six easy questions. Like what's a class P, what's a class NP, what is NP complete and what's hierarchy? I, I don't remember that by heart. Um, so it's it just one hour work to learn this, I guess, or, or, or maybe half a day work or something. Yeah, and so, but there are people who don't know this, they fail. Um, okay, and then colloquium, uh, so, but I will not check basic knowledge. So the colloquium consists of two lists, one with intermediate questions and one with difficult questions. So learn the list of intermediate questions, make sure you know all of them. And then I will ask a question from these two lists. And if you know intermediate question correctly, you get three points, then you get um, like uh, four points for showing up and knowing basic knowledge. I won't test it unless you fail even intermediate uh, question. And uh, then you have seven here and then you uh, fail uh, pass like uh, so on the exam, uh, you can, you probably already have four out of 10 without doing exam. And if not, you can come to the exam, solve a few questions and, and you're fine. Uh, Will we have notes of lectures? So no, uh, um, sometimes when there is no clear place to learn from, I will make notes like on circuits, I will make notes. I will try to make a few more notes, um, but 
uh, you will need to use some sort of book or introduction to theory of computation, or maybe share some Russian source that is very standard materials. Um, there will, uh, yeah, but the, the videos will be on YouTube, so you can always watch them. More questions? Uh, I recommend it, uh, to make notes myself. Ah, okay, yeah. If somebody makes notes and want to share it, then, uh, or, or sell it, that's oh, even better. I, I mean, uh, is it recommended? Can I uh, finish the course, uh, the course without uh, making my notes? Well, you, there is a list of colloquium questions. And if you can solve the exercises from the seminars, you will have maximal score. It's very easy. So, uh, oh, okay. And and whether you read it in SIPS or book or listen to the lectures and and make notes. Uh, so I think it, it's not necessary, but it's a matter of what's more efficient for you. I think it, for some students it's a good idea to make notes, especially if you watch from home, because uh, online watching is pretty dangerous. So we have to do it because seminarist is in another country. Um, uh, uh, but but seminars will also be here, but uh, he will not be here. So the, uh, so people are like covering it up. I think I, I don't know how it works. Um, so uh, that that's why we have to offer online version. Um, but it's dangerous because if you comfortably sit home, and then uh, people tend to think when they sit home in front of the computer, they're the most clever person in history of humanity. And so uh, if you do not have like real drive to understand everything into the details, then watching from home is very dangerous. So uh, every lecture you understand less, less fraction of the lecture. And then, um, and I see it in, in the uh, in colloquial, it's the word obvious is everywhere with such people. And uh, so uh, just warning that it's better to sit in the lecture and, and because it's somehow physical presence it gives more adrenaline and yeah okay so now only one person sits in the lecture but i i'm happy because i know a very nice person so <laughs> okay yes more questions okay so that's not blah blah then we need to go to the start of the course Okay, so let's do things that you already know. Uh, like what is an alphabet? So, uh, so we uh, we will focus on decision problems for languages. Um, and so, what is language? First, we have to say alphabet, and that's just a um, finite non-empty set. Very boring. Binary alphabet is set with two elements, zero and one. I will not write it. Uh, a word is uh, a seek. Okay, elements, they're called symbols. So a word is uh, a finite list of symbols. So a finite list of elements from an alphabet. So a word over alphabet is, uh, and so if, if uh, Sigma is alphabet, then sigma star, finite list of so sigma star is the finite. So let's do an example. Um, zero one star is equal to empty word. Zero one. Okay, I think most of you already know this, but okay, let, let, let's be complete. 
and so what is the language uh, is, uh, is just a subset of the field of slack. Uh, for an example of uh, language is spawning drones. Spawning drones over binary. Let's say binary spawning drones is equal to the sort of word W1, W1, and the W1 so for example, zero zero one is equal to zero or one one zero one one uh, are found in the wrong so of length they're also even length like zero zero. Okay. And so now, we, why do we focus on decision problems on languages? Because in the company, they ask like, okay, what's the biggest, uh, they can ask optimization problems. Like, uh, okay, we need to do a bunch of tasks and it reduces to independent set problems because there are conflicts between resources. Uh, okay, let, let, let's take an example. I, I guess I should explain what is independent set problem. Uh, Or do you already know this problem? So give me a graph, an independent set uh, is a set of vertices. Yeah. That uh, such so that any two vertices in the set are not connected. For example, this and this. So the two nodes in this graph, they are an independent set of size two. So does this graph have independent set of size three? So if, if it's easy and you want to make to go faster, just answer and then I can go faster. Okay. So this set doesn't have, uh, no, and because, uh, so, this, so it has to be point on the diagonal if we have two, um, and uh, then we cannot add any other point. Okay. Uh, so why did I speak about independent set problem? Ah, okay. Uh, and and so in 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 a company, there are like uh, here is an example. One has to do five tasks, and one wants to do maximal number of tasks, but unfortunately there are resources conflicts in resources. Like with processor has this problem. There are five, like uh, multiply some numbers and 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 such things. And various tasks, and there's many blocks available to to uh, execute this task. Uh, but like one task can use several blocks, and there can be conflicts between them. But he wants to do as many tasks as possible, as fast as possible. And so he will build a graph. Okay, this is very simplified. By the way, all these problems in university are very simplified. If you work in company, your task is to scrape off all irrelevant details and then uh, uh, check what algorithms exist to apply them. And, and so if you know it's in P, you, uh, you will find direct algorithm or uh, clear instructions on how to solve it. If it's an NP, you will need to do more research on how to deal with this. So if something is NP complete, it means it's trouble. And this independent set problem, like given a graph, find an independent set of certain size uh, is NP complete problem. So that's, uh, I'm now speaking about one that gives trouble. Um, okay, and, and then so here in this example, we get a bunch of tasks. The question uh, in practice will be select the maximal size of a set that is independent and can be done simultaneously. Uh, but so we will focus on decision problems of languages. So this is on graphs, not on languages. So what is the connection between these two? And things is that we will have certain encodings. So here is a graph. Um, and in such a book, encodings of things are always written with this less than, greater than brackets. Um, uh, and a graph, we will use fixed encoding. We will use adjacency matrix. So if it has n nodes, we will have uh, we will map it to a word by flattening adjacency matrix. 
And so it's a bit string of length and square. Uh, okay, so that means problem. Uh, so there's just standard things like a binary word. Of course, that's easy to 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 encode. And so there's, there's uh, for example, uh, in the independent set problem, we get two inputs: the graph and the number. And so their binary encoding is like written with the brackets. So what is here? We have an adjacency matrix. Well, not binary encoding, just uh, encoding in, in, in a fixed alphabet because sometimes we use blanks or something. And encodings are not so important. Just uh, only one thing is important to remember. By default, graphs are uh, in this course with incidence matrix. We will we won't use sparse uh, um, uh, adjacent uh, with edgeless representation. In practice, it's almost always better to to use adjacency list because the decrees in, in practice tend to be constant. But just for convenience in this course, we uh, encode the graph uh, with n nodes using a string of length n square. Okay, um, uh, so and and here there is a concatenation. With the binary number. So then you can think of, of uh, n squared bits from a density matrix, a blank, and then some number and binary. So numbers are always written in binary. And so encoding is important because we measure a runtime compared to all the inputs in their standard encoding. So in this course, we will speak about rough measures. So we don't care about polynomial, whether something is runs in quadratic time or cubic time or to the four. I mean, in 99% of cases, we will we will not care about this. And so uh, uh, any problem that we speak about, uh, it, it has natural binary uh, encoding. So, um, okay, second question is uh, like, we want to transform. Uh, so in, in practice, you want to find the largest clique, uh, the, the largest independent set. But here we speak about decision problem. We are given a second input k, that's our target, and we want to find independent set of certain size k. So the, the, the uh, but in pre so in our theory, this is the same problem. Because we can do binary search on K, and this slows down our algorithm uh, in uh, proportional to the input length of K. So that's uh, polynomially slower to produce, uh, to, to, to find the best K. Uh, so, so if you don't know K, you can find it with binary search. And of course, it's polynomially slower because K will, in this problem will be between one and N. So it's actually logarithmically slow in this case. Uh, but, but for NAPSEC, you will also get integers and then you need to be more clever. You cannot try all values of K, you do binary search, but it's still polynomially slower. Uh, okay, so the, but then, so we don't know K, we only get the graph and we find K or stuff. So there is another thing we need to do is actually produce the independent set. And uh, so how we can do this? Well, it's seminar exercise. If I remember correctly, let me check. Well, we can try and we are Okay, so it's problem 1.4. So I, I will give another example. Let's speak about Hamiltonian. Yeah, sorry for uh, interrupting you. And uh, so please repeat that if you stay for the seminar. <laughs> okay, so let, let's speak about another graph problem. It's called Hamiltonian cycle problem. And this is uh, like the theoretical version of traveling salesman problem. So Hamiltonian was a famous physicist from 19th century, and uh, he invented like a nice game. He, he had a certain graph, uh, dodecahedron, and um, one player has to build a path of length five, and the other player um, needs to complete it, uh, co complete this path to a cycle that visits every node exactly one time. 
and, and so the uh, it was so Hamilton was great physicist and the most important physical notion in quantum mechanics is Hamiltonian named after him and so he uh, introduced this game but it was financial failure he uh, tried to sell it and lost a lot of money but uh, the most uh, one of the most important things Hamiltonian is named after him and that's just a cycle and a graph that visits every node exactly once so I don't need to say well a cycle means already in the definition at most ones. Um, okay. And, and so here, this graph does have Hamiltonian cycle. So you can go like this and like this. And so you can every note exactly once. So uh, let's make another example. So this graph does not have a Hamiltonian cycle. So do you see why? Well, because we should uh, go, go through and turn after that, so, yeah. really, so, twice. Yeah. so the only way to visit this one is to go to this node twice. Uh, so no Hamiltonian cycle. And uh, and so here, uh, the question is, uh, um, so the Hamiltonian cycle problem, there we are given input to graph G, and the question so does G have a Hamiltonian cycle? So this is the problem. It's another problem that's famous for being anti-complete. We will learn this. Well, uh, I know it doesn't have like an anti or just a... So yes, of course, and call it so... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, if if the graph has a nodes, just a bit string of length and square. But okay, it doesn't matter to think about this because uh, we, we think in high level and the encoding doesn't matter. And since we don't care about runtime up to polynomials, uh, you can be quite free in the coding. Just the, the, there is a tricky thing here. If you use edge list representation, then the, um, sets with many isolated nodes, so, so the graph is not connected. Something tricky can happen with the time bound. So that's why I deviate from your algorithm scores a little bit. Okay. Uh, but so, uh, and why is this problem important? So there is the delivery guy problem, like uh, whatever, Amazon, Yandex, uh, the, the every morning they have a bunch of packages that need to be delivered. And uh, uh, so the, there are little trucks, and they need to organize them in cycles so that all deliveries are common. Uh, and so uh, it, it's very close. So the, the so delivery guy problem is very closely related to traveling salesman problem, which in turn is related to this problem. Um, so in, in algorithmic sense. Um, and um, okay, and so Yandex uh, does not need to know for a given graph whether it has a Hamiltonian cycle or not. It needs to know the Hamiltonian cycle. But imagine that uh, you have efficient algorithm. L let's fantasize. We don't know whether it exists, but let's fantasize someday a person finds polynomial time algorithm for the decision problem. So you give it the graph, it says yes or no. Depending on. So, how can you build the Hamiltonian cycle? So, uh, well, it goes as follows. Uh, let, let, let's go with this graph. So, we, we don't know. So, the plan well, is we can try to to bring up the submarine uh, nodes and after that to try to have this guy rather than the, uh, the rest of the graph and the rest of the internal cycle. I mean, depending on that, it's so much bigger and it comes to the next Yeah, so I, I will explain it slightly differently. Okay. So let, let's just go over all edges. Uh, for example, let's look at this edge and let's remove it from the graph. And then ask again, does the graph still have Hamiltonian cycle? And if the answer is yes, we definitely forever remove this edge. Otherwise we put it back and we try the next edge. 
and we do it for all the edges. And then at the end, we will, uh, we will see a cycle that's Hamiltonian cycle or conclude that there is no Hamiltonian cycle. And so, sorry, in the first step, we, we just check whether at least Hamilton, one Hamiltonian cycle exists, and then we try all edges to, to remove it. So, for example, if this edge, we will remove it, and then we will see there is still a Hamiltonian cycle. And then we can try to remove the other edges, and then the answer will be no. And then we are finished removing edges. We check, and indeed, we have Hamiltonian cycle. So this is a silly example, we only removed one edge. Okay, so uh, if we solve decision problem in polynomial time, we solve production problem in polynomial time. Okay. So that's why we care about decision problems. What's the time? It's seven and that's oh, and over half. And I always hope that we found this. So now, uh, uh, you know basic definition so let's start with first and uh, uh, let's start with Turing. so in algorithm course people count elementary operations and so in pan's name it's like a rub model or word rub model they use and um we will not use this computational model we will use different model and so we will measure time by uh running algorithms on Turing machines and counting elementary steps. And so uh, Turing machines is a very bad way to measure time when you need to measure it um, uh, uh, like very carefully. It, the difference between quadratic and cubic is important. Don't use Turing machines. And in algorithm, of course, it's pretty important. Um, but advantages of Turing machines is just a device that has one elementary operation. And so we can write down formal definition very easily. Um, and the slowdown compared to a um, RAM model with where you count binary operations is polynomial. So, uh, so it's good enough for our purposes, but definition is, is more easy. And why do we need simple definition? So we want to prove that a certain problem is hard and P complete, but proving this, we cannot prove definitely because P versus NP problem is very famous sort of problem. Uh, however, we can do something else. So to prove that one problem is uh, difficult, we will prove that to solve it, we're basically solving all problems that can be solved using certain type of device. And this will always be variant of Turing machine. And what we have to do is we have to encode computations of, uh, of our computational device inside a problem. That's what we will be doing all the time to prove that this other problem is difficult. Uh, and so we, what we need for this is a very simple computational device. So that's the reason why in this course there are Turing machines and algorithms course to count elementary operations in RAM model. Okay. Uh, well, let us now finally present the definition of Turing machine. Well, it has two, uh, only two parts. It's computation head and tape. And so tape consists of cells. And in each cell, there is a symbol from alpha head. Um, and the, the, the that the is just yeah. So, uh, so typically, uh, alpha gamma, and it must contain a symbol from alpha, and it must contain a blank symbol. And here is computation head, and computation head it can move over the tape cell. So it's always located above exactly one tape cell, and it can move one step left or right in every computation uh, uh, step. And this uh, has a state. And this comes from the finite set. Okay. 
And so now uh, with this device, you can transform words to words and you can also solve decision problem, like say whether a word is in the language or not. And so it will do this by repeating the same elementary operation over and over again until it stops. And so what is this elementary operation? So in, in every cell there is a symbol and in each step, the machine will read the symbol and then depending on its state and the symbol it reads, it will write the new symbol. It will delete A and then write B and then move left or right and get to a new state. So elementary operations is called read, write, move operation. So depending on Q and the symbol it reads, it will move. Uh, so, so, so it, it will write the new symbol, then move uh, left or right, and then get a new state. So that's elementary operation. And so um, uh, depending on the state and the symbol, it will do something. And uh, this behavior is encoded in transition table. So um, there is like a nice thing called state diagram of Turing machine, and uh, I will draw one. So let's now go, uh, okay, sh should I repeat this or, uh, you know what, I, I, let's go directly to example. So I will draw a Turing machine uh, here on the bottom, and it has two states, F and F. So, but by the way, initially the machine is located over, so the state is halfway infinite. So it has a start point and goes infinite in some direction. Initially, the machine is located on the first state itself, and it is in a, a, a special state called the start state. So, and I will use notation from finite automata. I put an arrow here. And then uh, this machine, okay. I will, for the sake of the example, I will uh, flip the tape. So normally, it doesn't matter how you write it. So I will have the tape that starts at the right and go here. And um, well, um, the, the machine is doing the following. So let me think. I didn't write down the example. So when it sees the blank, it will write uh, a one. When it sees a zero, it will write a one and move left. And when it sees a one, uh, when it sees a one, uh, it will move. It will move. Uh, it will write zero and also move left. So that it, it's visible, right? Okay. So that's the Turing machine. So see how it works. So uh, initially, the head is in state. The head is about the first state cell, and it is in state S. And so let's put a uh, word on here. One, one, zero, one, followed by infinitely many legs. So initially, the tape, when, when the computation has started, there is an, a sequence of symbols that do not contain the blank symbol. And then it's followed by only blank symbols. That's how the machine is started, how the tape is initialized. And this sequence of non-blank symbols is called program or input word. Okay, and so I've drawn the machine here. And so let us see what the machine is doing in every elementary operation. So, uh, so after the first elementary operation, it will read a one, write a zero, and move left. So initially it's an S, it will read one, write zero, and move left. So we will get one, one, the machine will be here, and it will be again an S. By the way, uh, for who is new about Turing machines? Who learns about this for the first time? Oh, everyone knows already. 
I can skip it. No, I, I don't know what is uh, the Turing machine. Ah, okay, okay, no problem. Then I, I explain. Uh, okay, Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. So that's after first step. After second step, same thing happens. But now, uh, uh, the machine is about the zero. That's okay. so actually the zero. One, two, three. And so when it sees a zero, then the machine will go to this state F. So between the machine here in the state F. And so machine is in state F. Okay, and in state F, there is no outgoing edge. It means that transition table doesn't have a line that starts for the state F. It means the machine stops. Okay. So Why did it get to just? Uh... Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. What is Q, A, and, and B? Uh, uh, okay. So uh, hopefully you're. Question is already answered uh, with this example for Q, A, and B. Okay. Okay. So he, uh, so, so now there is a question. <laughs> this state doesn't have outgoing edges. And that means that the transition table is undefined when the machine is in F and above symbol one. There is no outgoing edge that contains the symbol one. And then we say that the machine stops. Okay. Conceptually, I understand Q, A, B, M, Q, that, that's, that's, that function, I guess. Uh, but I, I don't get the notation of what, what is Q, uh, what is Q over score? Well, here is, so, so for every edge, we have five things. We have a uh, start state, so for every edge. Then we have the symbol that we read. So this is the, the, the Q, A notation. So the first two things is the start node from the edge and the first symbol here. Then the symbol we write, B, then the move we make, and then the new state. So every five tuple is just what we see in an edge. Okay? So Q is the start state uh, before the function. Uh, Q over score is... Uh, after the operation, I guess, uh, the state. Uh, so in the so every edge is a five tuple. And the, the table is just a list of all the five tuples or the set of all five tuples. So but yeah, so I, I, I will now, maybe it's time to write down formal definition. So Turing machine is five tuple like finite state machine. So there is the set of all possible states of the computation head. Then there is a tape alphabet. So this must be finite set. So let's see that. And during machine and line gamma start state transition table, something called accept states. I will tell it later. And so alphabet that must contain length. Then the start state has multiple Q. Delta is a subset of Q times gamma times gamma times left right times Q. So this is it. We have a table. So in, uh, in this case, the table is uh, S uh, one. So there are three edges in this graph, in this directed graph. And so with the transition table here, it has um, three, uh, three lines. 
but the, this uh, the state diagram is very convenient way to write down the Turing string. So this connection now is here. Oh, and I forgot to say at the F is just a subset of Q. It's called accepting states. Uh, and this is when we use the machine for the decider. Then we will check uh, whether the state, so we will say that a word is in the language. So uh, we, will, we will think that the word, that the machine says the word is in the language if it ends in a state, uh, uh, or let's call it A, from accepting state. So that's a set of accepting states. And, that's it. and if it halts, sorry, if it halts in, in another state, then uh, uh, the machine rejects it. So that's in the case we use the machine as a decider. But in this example, we use the machine to transfer words, to map words to words. Okay. So uh, uh, one more question. Uh, why do we need uh, A and B if we have the start state and the end state of uh, well, actually, each player? Is, if I'm referring here to my previous notation where I say QA goes to uh, like B and Q children. So, okay, we don't need this action. So, we just uh, table. Oh, okay, good question. Thank you. Now, better. Uh, I didn't get it. Uh, we have the start state and the end state of the operation. Uh, why do we need? Uh, a and B. Okay, I, ah. I removed A and ah. B because of no. confusion. So let's pretend I never wrote this. Uh. So A and yeah. So I, I spoke about it because I previously spoke about it, but since it's not helping, let's delete this and make sure you understand the board now. Okay, in the meantime, um, here is this nice Turing machine that maps strings to strings, and we can interpret strings as numbers in binary. And this is a machine that maps numbers to numbers in an interesting way. So can you tell me uh, what operation on numbers this machine calculates? Um, General this specific theorem. So I read in here transition speed. So uh, in the meantime, I, I will write the, the student machine with the full five thousand. So the states Q are uh, I see that. Then the gamma is zero one on this line. Uh, and uh, delta, okay, I don't know where delta is here. And so this is the element. And the accept state, we don't need all of this. But this is five double that we discussed here in the example. Okay, so. Uh, is it clear what, so should I explain again what this elementary computation step? There was something in the chat. Yeah, so good answer is in the chat. And so this machine maps numbers to numbers and it adds one. So in every step, here the machine starts an S and then it sees one, it will, so, so imagine that uh, the machine stands above zero followed by all blanks. Then it will just map the zero to a one and it will stop. So zero goes to one. When it sees a one followed by blanks, it will move one to zero and then write a one on the next step. Because when it's above a blank, it will write a one. And so uh, you can see here, remember, um, this number that eight plus two plus one is uh, eleven goes to twelve. 
Okay. So should I repeat one more time what, what is on my three operation? Well, this just read, write, move operation. Depending on scene, it reads a symbol, it writes another symbol. Depending on state and what it reads, right? Another symbol makes a move left to right and goes to the next state. Okay, and it iterates until the transition table has no uh, uh, no pair state symbol for which there is a line. Then the computation is stopped and uh, we're finished. Okay, I say it again, we can use machines not only to map strings to string, but also to the, uh, decide a language. So, so what is uh, the language recognized by a machine is all the, the set of all input strings for which the machine terminates in the state from A. So to a Turing machine, we can associate a language. We say it's the language recognized by a Turing machine. It's the set of all strings. Strings should not contain length, so all strings without length, for which a um, Turing machine uh, has a halting computation and, this, uh, uh, and the final state in this computation belongs to this set. And, uh, yeah, we can call the decider of this language. Um, oh, sorry, a recognizer of this recognizer. language. Recognizer. And um, if additionally the machine terminates on every input, then we call it a decider. Mm. So, 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 the, so the machine can't uh, just uh, input the input the decider. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but so when do I need to stop in 10 minutes, right? Okay. So uh, let's quickly say how uh, how a machine works and uh, that recognizes palindromes. So you remember palindromes, they're worse if you say it opposite, like kayak in English, if you reverse it, it's the same word. That's palindromes. We can also do it for binary string. And so how will the machine work? So what's like high level description of the machine that recognizes problem problems? Well, we should to, to look uh, to the left of the right, if the symbols are equal, then the machine goes over. The yeah, and the uh, if it's not, then it should uh, reject it. Yeah. And uh, after, after that, it uh, should uh, all the symbols uh, to the left of the, to the right is blank. Uh, the should yeah. So a high level idea is so let's start the machine, and uh, it will go here, and here we have finite too many states, and we can always use the computation head to remember finite uh, a finite amount of information, and so it will have two states for zero and one. And then uh, uh, it will go in this state and it will go to the, so it will replace this symbol by a blank and remember it, uh, and it will go to a state, let's say Q is zero. So it has two special states, Q zero and Q one. It will go to Q zero and then check whether it will go here, check whether the last symbol before a blank is also zero. And if this is not the case, it will terminate otherwise, uh, it will remove the zero by a blank, and then we return to the first uh, blank symbol. Then it will repeat the process. It will step one step more, and then read the next bit and check whether it's the same as in the uh, the last bit. And so each time it, uh, from both sides, it transforms the string uh, to all blanks. And so the it, machine. Uh can move more than one symbol uh, at yeah, one in the time. Computation, it moves as long as it doesn't treat a state uh, for which uh, the line and transition table is absent. It can compute arbitrarily long. Uh, and so in this example, it will go back and forth each time comparing the last non-visited bit with the first uh, non-visited uh, bit. And so it will, uh, so if we give it a word 
uh, of length n. Then the, this machine, how many uh, elementary steps will it do? Will it be linear, quadratic, cubic before it terminates? So it's question. So imagine that for given n, this machine runs uh, uh, runs its computation. But by the way, if it, 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 it needs two subsequent blanks, if there are no non-blank symbols left anymore, then the machine is finished and it goes to accept state. But if, uh, uh, if two symbols do not match, it will terminate in, in a state that's not in A. It means it will reject the state. So, okay, so this is uh, this machine is a decider because we can build it carefully so that it always um, terminates, always terminates. And so this uh, machine decides binary palindromes. And the question is how many elementary operation steps do we need for the, in this process? Is it linear, uh, quadratic, cubic, exponential? What do you think? Okay, so one person says linear. Do people... I think. Somebody says something silently. Let's put it uh, down. Okay. Quadratic. Quadratic is another guess. So more diff, more. Uh, so what do other people think? So indeed, it's quadratic yeah, because. Uh, in the beginning, we need to go from front to the right, it's n steps. But then we have removed uh, so, and we have to return. So that's like two n steps. But then uh, we have two symbols left, so we have two n minus two. And so we continue uh, until we have four plus two. Uh, and so we are done. But I'm just counting like uh, uh, it's rough estimate. So, so first it's close to n, then it's just too less to travel back and forth, but there are like a little bit of jiggling in, in, in the end, uh, but, but it is much smaller than, than the traveling, the time to travel back and forth. So this, uh, uh, if we add this up, all the numbers, so you know that one plus two plus n one plus n, it's equal to n, n plus one, n plus one. So that's quadratic time. Well, we will use notation like time of the Turing machine n on some input for w, and in our case, it is order length of w. So here is this notation of time. Okay, we can do better with two tape Turing machines. Um, so, uh, two tape two tape Turing machines is self-explanatory uh, definition. So, uh, okay. so there's just a machine. It has a computation and and two tape. So there's computation home. And so now it has um, read write heads, and these two read write heads they can move independently from each other. And so now uh, an elementary operation is read read, write write, and move move. So all, all the actions are double, and then it goes to a new state. So that means that transition table. So th this is for one tape Turing machine. By default, everything in SIPs or book is for one tape Turing machines. But in all other books, it's uh, multi-tape Turing machines. Uh, so of course, we can adapt this definition for three, four, and, and, and any number of tapes you want. But let's talk about two tape Turing machines for, for a bit. Um, OK, so uh, yes. So two tape Turing machine. So that means in, in the definition, we have to uh, change something. So, so, okay, let's say one more time. So this computation head, it will read the two cells uh, belong at read writes heads. 
And then depending on current state and what it reads, it will decide what to write in both cells and where to move. And it can move independently, right with the first state, left with the other state, or both right, depending on state and, and what it's right. So that means that transition, so in all of the definition, everything remains the same, except the definition of transition table. So it, the only thing that changes here and for two tape Turing machines is that, so there is one table. So now let me define two tape Turing machines. And so the only thing we have here is we have squares on the, the actual symbol. And so it reads two symbols on the two cells, it writes separate things and it reads. Okay. And so now with this machine, we can decide palindromes not in quadratic time, but in linear time. So how does it work? Well, such a machine, it receives input where W1, W2, and so on, Wn followed by W. In the beginning, we have input where for program uh, that has no blanks followed by all blanks. And so, uh, how can palindromes be recognized in, in linear time? In the first step, uh, the machine will copy the input to its second phase. So, it, uh, in, not the first step, I mean, first phase will copy the input. So, then it will have a uh, computation head of one tape at the end and the other in the beginning. So, in, so in first the computation has copied whatever there is on, on the first uh, on the first pass. One head returns and then it reads in opposite directions. When it sees uh, two different symbols on the computation heads, it will terminate in a state that is not an accepted state. And when uh, when it, the, the computation has read the end of the tape, it will terminate in accepting, uh, with, without conflict, it will terminate in accepting. So palindromes can be recognized in, in linear. So uh, let's go to what's carried on. So we define Turing machines. We define this. Okay, if I will move to the next week, it's not a problem. Um, and so the last two things I need to do now, and that's there is no time left, but it's not so much work, um, is to tell you what is this, uh, the simulation here on the quadratic time, and just write down a bunch of definitions. So I will teach uh, 10 minutes longer, and then we will start the seminar 10 minutes later so that we have everything for the seminar. Okay, so. Uh, um, so there is a theorem that says that uh, we can simulate two tape Turing machine on one tape Turing machine with quadratic increase of runtime. And again, in this course, we don't care about polynomial increase. So uh, it doesn't matter which definition. Also, we take the same Turing Yeah, yeah. But so, by the way, yeah. Any multi tape Turing machine we can simulate with two, ta two tape, with two tapes um, with logarithmic overhead. But, okay, let's start with two tape. Uh, okay. So the theorem is simple. For every Turing two tape Turing machine, there is a one tape Turing machine, and uh, that for every input produces the same answer, and the runtime is at most the square of the uh, previous machine plus length of input. Yeah. Yeah. 
there exists a clustering speak about the of for every two So that's the binary of Yes, we got one time. So this is the theorem. So here I have added the length of the word. I, this is not necessary, but to get simple proof or start, I will explain why it's not either. But let's start with this version. So how it's proven. Uh, idea is very simple. So we have a Turing machine uh, with two takes. right there. And, um, and we need to present the two tapes on one tape and then simulate computation study. So this machine and this machine. Uh, so for this, we will add, uh, we will consider the same alphabet, but we will add a few things. So we will have, uh, for every symbol, we will have a copy of the symbol. We called it the marked symbol. And we will add a hashtag. And the hashtag will be used to uh, represent the two tapes and sequence of each other. And we will also mark this to mark the end of the second tape. This here we will have tape one. Here we have tape one. Two. Uh, and then just rewrite down the contents of page one and up to the moment where is the infinite tail with blanks. So if there are some extra blanks here, it's not a big deal. Like if the machine goes left and writes some blanks. So there might be some, some blank, but at least this is a finite part. Okay, and then uh, uh, we need to simulate so how works the simulation? So machine M. So, so when M makes one step, it reads the two cells, then it writes something in these two cells, and then it moves the computation M. So machine N will uh, to, to, to simulate one step, machine N will start here. And it will use a marked symbol on the position uh, of the computation M. But the other sim here we will have unmarked symbol. So just in, in every tape contents, there is one marked symbol to remember position. And here somewhere it is this kind of symbol that is marked. So to, to simulate one computation step machine starts here, it goes over all symbol and it remembers the marked symbol. So how can a machine remember marked symbols? It's just like um, it clear the states belong to Q. Then here we can have uh, a set Q times uh, gamma squared. So we increase the number of states in the computation head. And so when this machine is here in the state Q, we will here go to the state Q AD. So there are much more states, but the number of states is constant. That's the only requirement for Turing machine. Okay. And so simulating one operation step to go over all, all, all marked symbols. 
uh, and then return to, to the hashtag and then modify the marked symbols to what is ready. So machine makes a second pass to modify the symbols, then returns, and then it can uh, move the marked symbols to simulate the movement of computation. So in this case, it goes three times back and forth. Well, actually two times is now, because uh, writing and moving you can do at the same time. So is it clear? Can you repeat a little about the symbols with the uniform? Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, alphabet of this theory machine has uh, so gamma here. So here we have alphabet gamma. Here we don't have gamma here. Let's say gamma dot. It contains a copy of all uh, symbols in gamma. And when I use them, I write the dot here. And so we represent the tape. So we start with hashtag tape one, hashtag tape two, hashtag. Three. And all the symbols are normal symbols from gamma, except the symbol at the position of the uh, computation head. So this symbol has a dot. And same for tape two. And so we just need to update this representation. So machine will go uh, two times or three times over the state. So it's uh, at the beginning of simulation of one step, it says here, read the two dotted symbols, put it in its memory using this extra state, then return. Well, and then makes modification and then return again. We just need to the symbols to, to remember where we put that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we can use other ways to do it. We, we can, for example, uh, take another and another symbol outside the But we could uh, put a star here mm -hmm. and then insert an extra star, a cell with a star. I, I mean, just reserve extra. Just okay. use the star and follow by a symbol. It's another way. There are many ways to, to prove this uh, theory. Okay. And so why did I write this W here? Somebody knows. Yeah. Uh, so I initially, so, so, so the start state from the simulation corresponds to uh, something like this, and then the, the input works with the top, and then the last class, and then uh, so, uh, so in the beginning, we receive the tape with just the word followed by blank, and then we have to uh, prevent a hashtag and uh, append these things, and then we can start the simulation. But if we're more clever, we can do it on the fly. And that's why this term actually can be uh, removed. But I'm not going to do this for this. Okay, and now the very last thing I have to do, I'm sorry for 15 minutes late. Next time I go by hard one. And well, that's just the definition. So time f, so if f is a function of natural numbers to natural numbers, then uh, then the class time f is just the class of all languages for which there exists a Turing machine that decides this language in time order f of n, where n is the end of time. So time of f is equal to Time of F there exists. So the one thing Turing machine. When all books it's two, it's multi take Turing machine. So any number of tapes and sips or book it's one thing Turing machine. And we follow six. But there is one thing during the shift and uh, that decides
of note that these sites means it will accept all languages in R and it will reject all that all strings. Sorry, it will all accept all strings in L, reject uh, and reject all strings not in L. Reject means that it will terminate, but not in an accept state. Okay. It cites L and M for every word. W so that just a, a definition L over alpha by sigma for every W uh, time. Smaller than big of length of the so that's the definition of time. And then there are uh, famous classes. Okay, so uh, so we understood that falling bronze is an example of a uh, language of a language that's recognizable in quadratic time. So in time and um, yeah, and square. So by the way, to denote this function, there is a bad convention to fix the variable name n. So it's like something not n. So they say that falling bronze is in time and square. So here n should be understood as the length of the Yeah, Okay. Um, and uh, okay. the last definition. No, no, not last definition. So we can also define the function space of f. And here we replace uh, not time m, but the space of s. Uh, and what's the space used by one tape Turing machine? It's just the maximal position that the computation has, has been during computation. Okay. So we can say the same that the L is in the space. And all the same, just in space and of W is smaller than order. And also you should be happy. And okay. And then finally, uh, important definitions. So the class P is the union over time and to the power C for all C, for all integers. And the class P space is equal to the union again C of space and to the power C. And then the very last definition, and then the lecture is finished. Uh, X is equal to the meaning of all C of C to the power and to the powers. And so now that the powers priority of the subjects. And then X space, you can guess it. Is equal to the union of C per time together. Know that C is not a uh, linear concept, it's the power, the exponent of polynomial. Okay, that's all I need to explain for this lecture. More questions? Uh, so if there are no questions, uh, seminar will start a bit later uh, because the lecture was a bit slower. Uh, so what is the, the break in the schedule? Is it 10 minutes? Uh, okay. So then it means at 8 we will start the seminar. And it's supposed to stop at 9. Is it right? 
or nine ten. Okay, I will check it. Okay, so see you back at eight. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's seminar, so I will make sure it's late already. Everyone is tired, so I, I will try to stop at nine for seminar. So this week I will give seminar. Next week there will be other oh, person. Yeah. Yeah, it will be here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, very good. And so that they are online, and I got I prepared some copies. So I see that there are some new people. So seminar will start at eight, and the questions are on the wiki. So uh, if you already want to start thinking and solving them, <laughs> yeah, a copy. Yeah, because they told me at least forty students. So I made forty copies, but only one in the room. Okay, see you in ten minutes. Uh-huh.